All right, the true Christmas story. The true Christmas story. That's what we want to go through today. I want to teach you what actually happened at Christmas because, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about biblical stories because movies and traditions um, are repeated uh, more than the scriptures are. So, you know, during Christmas time, you might see something like this, right? So this is the nativity scene and, um, you know, you'll probably see these images around and, and features around, but, you know, this, uh, this scene is not actually accurate in the sense that, you know, you have the wise men here, you have the shepherds, you have the angels, you have the star over above uh, the stable with uh, Jesus in the manger. And people that are not familiar with the Christmas story think that uh, this is how it happened. So I like to teach um, and go through the Christmas story so you can see that this is not actually an accurate depiction of the nativity scene. And you'll see why as we go through it. So we're going to look at this story and where the reason why uh, Gershon read it in that order, because that is actually the chronological order uh, of events uh, in the Bible. So if you're wondering how the two Gospels weave together, we're going to look at them in chrono chronological order this morning and go through the passage, explain it to you, and uh, give you a few thoughts as we go through it. So let's start first with the story of Mary. So we know the Annunciation of the birth of Jesus Christ is visited by the angel. Luke 1, verse 26, and in the sixth month... So what is this sixth month you're referring to? If you know Luke uh, chapter 1, the first half, this is um, uh, the, the first half of Luke is when uh, John the Baptist is conceived, you know, with Elizabeth. Uh, it's not a, it's not a uh, miraculous conception, um, but she was uh, barren and Paso was a miracle in the sense that she was like Sarah, you know, she couldn't give birth, but she gave birth to John the Baptist, but not a virgin birth, right? So the virgin birth required for Jesus to be the sinless sacrifice. So six months after John the Baptist is conceived, this is when the angel Gabriel visits Mary, was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So uh, we've got a map here. So if you're wondering where Nazareth is, so this is where Judea is down here, Jerusalem and Bethlehem are down here. So they live up north here, past Samaria, um, in Nazareth. Nazareth. So that's where uh, they are living at the moment. Luke 1, 27, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph. So you see that they were, you know, similar to engagement we have today, but not, not exactly, because being espoused to somebody, you don't necessarily live together, or you may not have slept together, but you are still treated as their wife. So it's a lot, a lot stronger form of a bond than what we would consider engagement today, because engagement, engagements get called off, you know, they're not considered husband and wife, whereas... When you are espoused to somebody, you are actually considered their wife. So to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So we know that the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church have lifted up Mary almost to like a deity, you know, and some people refer to this as Mariology where they, they treat, you know, uh, Mary almost like a, as a lower god, where they, she knows everything, and then they find comfort in her, and they pray to her, and she can intercede on their behalf and all this. So, no doubt, Mary is a blessed woman in order to, you know, uh, carry the Lord Jesus Christ, and, you know, all that. But she's still a woman, nonetheless. You know, so when she dies, she does not answer prayers. She can't hear your prayers. Um, you don't pray to her. Uh, you, don't have, you shouldn't have statues of her around the place, thinking that she provides you good luck and all that sort of stuff, um, becoming very superstitious like they do in Mexico. She's a blessed woman, but she is a woman nonetheless. Now, there was a person in uh, the book of Luke 11, uh, a lady, and you can see what she said to Jesus when he was preaching. And it came to pass, as he spake these things, a certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, Blessed is the womb that bare thee and the paps which thou hast sucked. So she was giving praise to Mary, saying she was blessed, and rightly so, right? She's a blessed woman for being able to bear the Lord Jesus and to be able to bring him up. But look how Jesus responds in verse 28. But he said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and 
keep it. So the blessedness of Mary is not even greater than somebody that hears the word of God and keeps it. But she's a blessed woman nonetheless. And when, Luke 1, 29, and when she saw him, the, the angel, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Saying, she's thinking, why, why is this angel coming to him? You know, sometimes people were worried when angels would come to them, whether they would have good news or bad news. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary <coughs> unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? So obviously that's very important, because Jesus had to be sinless. This is why the you know, virgin birth is, is an important doctrine. Anyone that denies the virgin birth, that is a heretical teaching because we can't have a saviour that, that has sin, right? That, that is uh, the conception of a sinful man and woman. So this is why it's important that it's a virgin birth. And the angel answered and said unto her, so now we're given the explanation of how this occurs, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So now we know why Jesus Christ is referred to as the Son of God. What makes Jesus Christ a unique or the only begotten Son of God? Because physically, right, he was conceived of the Holy Ghost. And he's physically the Son of God. See, we are sons of Adam. Spiritually, we are sons of God. We are begotten sons of God. Right? So why is Jesus referred to in John 3.16 that he gave his only begotten son? Because physically he was conceived of the Holy Ghost and that one, that's what makes Jesus Christ unique. Verse 36, And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and we refer to here again, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So you see, she couldn't have a, a child, but now she was able to, um, due to her being able to conceive John the Baptist. And Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. I love Mary's attitude here when she hears the word of God and she hears God's will for her life that she did not you know, resist it like Moses did. Remember Moses, when he was told what to do, you know, he sort of made excuses. He said, oh, I'm not an eloquent speaker. Um, you remember Gideon, when Gideon uh, was visited by the Lord and, and said, hey, he's going to deliver Israel using Gideon. What did Gideon? Gideon was scared. Gideon tested God to see, you know, well, I'm going to lay the fleece and it's wet today and then tomorrow he says it was dry today and the dew's on the ground. But Mary did not. And you can see the faith of Mary here that when she is told by the angel the will of God, she said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. I mean, would to God that we have that attitude when we hear the will of God from the word of God and say, so it be, you know, be it unto me according to thy word. Verse 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. So you see here that this is Jerusalem down here. She's going into the hill coast, hill country, with haste into, the city, into a city of Judah. So we don't know exactly where Zacharias lives, but I mean, the border is like something like this of Ju Judea. So, you know, maybe it's in one of the cities here. And possibly Zacharias, being a priest, lived closer to Jerusalem where the temple was because that was his job, right? He, he had a job in the temple and maybe that's why he lived a bit closer um, there. He didn't have to. There were cities of refuge all around the place, but it looks like uh, he did. Now, one thing I think about why Mary went to go visit Elizabeth is because, look, she has just been told that the Holy Ghost is going to come upon her and she's going to conceive. But she's also told that her barren cousin is in the sixth month. So what I wonder is, why did she go 
to Zacharias and stay with her, I think maybe it's because she wanted to see whether what the angel said was true. You know, because if that was, if it was true, then, you know, you know, it sort of gives more confirmation of what's about to happen to her. So I always wondered, uh, you know, why Mary went, and maybe that's the reason why, to go and see whether the thing she was told of the angel really was, you know, because like I said, she didn't live with Elizabeth. Elizabeth lived, you know, in a different town. So she traveled, look how far she traveled to go um, visit her cousin and she stayed there for three months. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, so this is Mary arrives at the house of Zacharias, and at this time, I, you know, I, we, we're not 100% sure that Zacharias is living there. Because remember, she's going to the house of Zacharias, but Zacharias is right now in Jerusalem, serving um, at the temple. So, you know, we're not really sure if Zacharias is there when she arrives. But, you know, it, it got me thinking, you know, when I was thinking through this story, I was trying to think of different aspects of this story that we may not think about. And you would think that when Mary comes to Elizabeth, Surely, besides the things that are told in Luke chapter 1, they're probably talking about other stuff too. Like Elizabeth is saying, like, did you know that my husband got a vision in the temple and he's like, can't talk anymore? <laughs> you know, I mean, these sorts of things. And she's like, you know, she's probably saying like, well, I, you know, I've, I've been told that, you know, I'm going to give birth to, to the Lord. And um, so we, we're given a bit of the back and forth here, but you can imagine that as they spent three months together, they are pondering and discussing these different things, and you kind of wonder what other conversations they had uh, during this time. So it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb. So which babe is this? This is John the Baptist. John the Baptist is responding to the the greeting of Mary as she comes to stay with Elizabeth and Zacharias in the womb of Elizabeth. And this is an interesting, you know, this is like a pro-life argument, right? That the, the first person to really realize, other than Mary, that Jesus Christ was being born was a baby in the womb, John the Baptist. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And you'll notice here when somebody's filled with the Holy Ghost, what do they do? They speak the word of God with boldness. They don't, they're not they're like the Pentecostals where they're filled with the Holy Ghost and they fall on the ground, and they're rolling all over, and they're giggling and they lose control. No, she's filled with the Holy Ghost, verse 42, and she spake, right? Because when they're filled with the Holy Ghost, remember, what is the Spirit? The words that I speak to you, they are Spirit and they are life. So when somebody's filled with the Holy Ghost, they are ready to preach the word with boldness. She spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? So you see here that there, as you read through the birth of Jesus Christ and the events surrounding Jesus Christ, there's all these confirmations of what the angel told Mary is true. Right? Because Elizabeth didn't speak to the angel, right? Mary is coming to Elizabeth probably wondering, is what the angel, what the angel told her being confirmed? She's hearing it, right? But now Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Ghost, is also confirming and testifying of the word of God that what is conceived in Mary's womb is in fact the Lord. The mother of my Lord should come to me. For lo, as soon as a voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, so he's saying, as soon as I heard you say hello and greeting, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So you see how the, she knew that the baby, so you can see there that babies in the womb can have emotions. They can be happy, right? Just like this babe leaped in her womb for joy. And blessed is she that believes. So you can see there, why is Mary blessed? Because she believes the word of God, right? For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. So now Mary now is responding, preaching the word of God. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. 
So, you know, some people believe that, you know, Mary is lifted up so high, they don't even believe that she's a sinner. But you can see here that, you know, Mary acknowledges God as her saviour, which shows that she also is a sinner in need of a saviour. For he had regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Uh, when I read that verse, you know, she knew that all generations would call her blessed, but she realized that when she said that, that generations moving forward would worship her, you know, as a, as a uh, sort of lower deity. Um, I, didn't, I don't think so. I think she knew who the true God was, and she directed her worship towards the Lord. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. So now she is just, you know, preaching, saying God's word. When I say preaching, like she's, she is prophesying God's word, being filled with the Holy Ghost as well, and talking about how, you know, obviously Mary coming from humble origins, right? Living in Nazareth. So if you look up Nazareth, a lot of people believe that Nazareth is kind of like a, a lower socioeconomic place. She's come from there. She's blessed to be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you think about that, it's kind of like a Cinderella story, you know, where you know, Mary is this you know, lady, poor, you know, living in a, in a poor neighborhood, and yet she receives this blessing to be the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and here she is prophesying that, you know, this, the fact that God lifts up the humble and the lowly, that she is going to help Israel as well. And his mercy is on them that fear him. From generation to generation, he hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. So you can see how this is, he refers to her as well. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath holpen his servant Israel. So what is holpen? Holpen is just the past tense of help. His servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spake to our fathers to Abraham, to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So, you know, why? So, this is why I get thinking as well like, why did she stay three months? And, you know, I just wonder whether Mary stuck around, you know, because later on, I mean, it says here at verse 56 that she returned to her own house. But, verse 57 onwards, we see the events of John the Baptist's birth. And you remember when, when John the Baptist was born and he was circumcised, he was named John, what happened to Zacharias? He was able to speak again. So I also wonder whether Mary stuck around for that too, to see if what the angel told Zacharias was going to pass. And she witnessed also the birth of John the Baptist. You know, I'm just uh, wondering that, but... You know, you just see that, you know, as Mary and Joseph go through these different things, you know, I just wonder, like, what they must have been thinking. Because, you know, it's almost like that, you know, later on when you see in Luke and Jesus is 12 years old and, you know, they're worried about Jesus and, you know, you know later on, you know, you see interactions with Jesus and Mary. And it's just, it's just crazy to think that, you know, like, they, they experienced all this. I mean, I mean, if you were approached by an angel, you give birth, a, a virgin birth. You can see the Lord Jesus. You see the miracles of, you know, Elizabeth giving birth, Zacharias losing his voice, and we're going to see some other things too. You just think, surely, you know, these people knew who Jesus was, and uh, you know, but you, but it just shows the human nature that it doesn't always matter how much you know or even what you experience. You still uh, forget who Jesus Christ is, and you forget, um, you know, uh, these things that even the best of the, those people that, that went through this, they still, you know, you know, don't treat Jesus Christ. And yeah, I, I just reflect on these stories, and you just think, surely, surely. If you, you were the person that gave birth to Jesus, you would not be, you know, like we see some of the stories in, uh, later on in the New Testament. But, you know, I guess, you know, time, you know, you can forget these things. Now let's go to Joseph. Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. 
Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now, this is probably after she returns. If you remember, she was in, uh, she was down in the hill country in Judea. Now she's returned back up to Nazareth. And you know about three months later, you can see that a bump begins to show. So this is probably what has occurred. You know, she's found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man. So this is saying what he was thinking of doing here was not wrong. And not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privily. So Joseph considered divorcing his espoused wife, Mary, because she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And you think, this, is, this, is, this would be reasonable. I mean, she's away for three months, you know, and she comes back, she's pregnant. I mean, would you believe a woman that says, I was visited by an angel and told I was going to give birth to the Lord, the Messiah? I mean, surely Joseph as well is thinking, yeah, right. You know? <laughs> so, so it's understandable that he's thinking, my wife has cheated on me. Right? So it's not until he's sort of talked out of it <laughs> by his own angelic visit. But we don't know whether this angel is the same angel that visited Mary. A lot of people assume that the angel Gabriel is the one visiting and giving all these dreams and these visions. But in reality, we don't know who this angel is. We're not given the name. It just says, the angel of the Lord. So while he thought on these things, so he's considering divorcing his wife because he assumes that she has been unfaithful, right? And, you know, like, like I'm saying, you know, the conversation between Mary and Elizabeth, I wonder what the conversation within the house, of, well, they don't live together yet, but the conversation between Joseph and Mary, you wondered, was Mary, you know, sort of pleading with Joseph, you know, trying to convince him? You know, maybe not, but maybe interesting, something, something to think about. I wonder if anyone's ever, you know, uh, done some sort of uh, show about it. I haven't watched The Chosen yet, so I don't know if the, has The Chosen done that sort of thing where they add things to the story and they make you think about the interactions outside of what we read in the Bible. Well, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So he's confirmed what Mary, I'm sure, would have told him by an angel in a dream. And she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So that prophecy is in Isaiah 7.14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And it's interesting, if you go back to Isaiah 7, I believe it's King Ahaz. And I think he, he's, Isaiah is basically challenging him to ask, the king to ask for a sign, of, I think to win a battle. And the king's kind of trying to act, acting all pious, saying, no, no, I'm not going to tempt the Lord, I'm not going to ask the Lord for a sign. And Isaiah says, you know, how long are you going to weary the Lord? And he says, therefore, this shall be the sign but Isaiah is actually giving a prophetical sign of the future, of the coming Messiah, and not a sign of whether to win the battle or not. And this is the sign. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So Mary does not stay a perpetual virgin. Jesus has half-brothers and sisters, and we know their names in the Gospels. Matthew 13, 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren, James and Joseph, and Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? So you see Mary and Joseph, they knew that it was a virgin birth and that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. But you can see that as they try and share this news, not everybody is going to believe them. I'm sure many people 
in Nazareth thought, you know, Mary had committed fornication and maybe Joseph was trying to cover it up. You know, did they, a lot of people may not have believed these things, you know, believed what they were saying. I mean, you know, sometimes I wonder if you were living in Nazareth, would you have believed it? Would you have believed this poor family, virgin birth, they were giving birth to the Lord Jesus Christ? So you can see how even though there was miraculous things going on, people still needed to believe that this was God's word, right? And the word made flesh. All right, let's go to uh, the shepherds. Um, so we see there Joseph approached by the angel. You see, Joseph was a man of faith as well. I mean, when he was told by the angel that Mary had conceived uh, a child of the Holy Ghost, he did not hesitate either. He took her to be his wife. And maybe this is why this couple was chosen to be the Lord's earthly parents. It wasn't because of their stature. It wasn't because of their wealth. It was because of their faith, right? Now let's look at the story of the shepherds in Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So you can see here that governments have been unnecessarily burdening citizens with tax all, <laughs> all the way since the birth of Jesus Christ. I, mean, I don't know if this was a requirement, you know, of, um, you know, for them to go, go all the way back, but, you know, they had to travel. Look how far they had to travel just to go and pay their taxes, right? Nazareth to Bethlehem. Now, one thing you wonder, you know, like, did, did Mary and Joseph realise that by travelling back to Bethlehem to pay their taxes, that they were fulfilling prophecy? You know, because remember the wise men, when, when you see later, they knew that Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. So, my question is, did Mary and Joseph know that Jesus was meant to be born in Bethlehem of Judea when they lived in Nazareth? And if they didn't get taxed, would they have travelled down there to know that? I mean, who knows? I mean, this, is kind of, this is kind of like the story of uh, Jacob and Esau. You know, when Rebecca tricked Isaac, Rebecca was told that there was two nations in you and the younger shall serve uh, the, the elder shall serve the younger. And then knowing that, she tricked Isaac into blessing Jacob. So in tricking, the, in, in tricking Isaac, Jacob received the blessing. But would she have tricked Isaac if God didn't tell her that two nations were in you and the, younger, um, the older shall, elder shall serve the younger? It's like here. You know, what happened here? You know, we can't really see it from God's point of view, but you know, they, they were moved down to Bethlehem, and in doing so, they fulfilled Scripture. Right? So, I'm just like, so you can see that's, that box is Jerusalem. So that's the capital city, that's where the temple is, and now they're down at Bethlehem, so quite close to Jerusalem, but quite far from where they originally lived. And so it was that while they were there, and here's the, the Christmas story, we know, the days were accomplished that she should be Delivered. So she was quite pregnant when she arrived. I'm sure Stephanie can, uh, you know, relate to this. You know, she's going around just right before she delivered, feeling the biggest. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And they were in the same country, so now we get to the shepherds. Same country, shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. So again, we don't know if this is the angel Gabriel. Some people might think that, but again, it's an unknown angel. Right? Angel of the Lord is coming to the shepherds. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. 
And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So I think this is very important in the nativity scene, that Jesus is wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, because this was the sign to the shepherds to look for a baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now, is this host all angels? Is it people in heaven as well praising them? You know, who knows? But it generally it's depicted as a, a bunch of angels praising the Lord and praising uh, our God. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. So notice that there's no angels present at the stable. And this is why when I showed you that original nativity scene where there's angels and the wise men all there at the stable, I don't think it's an accurate picture of what actually happens and people think that they are present. No, the angels visit who? The shepherds in the country. And that's where they are praising God in front of the shepherds. And then they go away, the Bible says, back into heaven. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away, verse 15, from them into heaven, the angels said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. So what we learn here is, I think it's important that when we hear God's word and that we submit to God's word, and sometimes if we don't act on God's word, we may miss out on a blessing or some reward or something that God has prepared for us. Because they, they could have said, oh, you know, that's great. It's great to hear that Jesus Christ is born in, Beth in, in Bethlehem. But no, they acted on it. They wanted to see the Lord, right? And if they acted on it, they got to see the Lord. So this is kind of why I got this thought about Mary traveling to Elizabeth. She was told something. She wanted to go see if what, if what she was told was actually going to happen. And it's the same with the shepherds. They didn't just want to hear it. They wanted to go see. And when they'd seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. So this is a great analogy with salvation, right? You hear it, you believe it, right? That's them like seeing the Lord, but they didn't keep it to themselves, right? You don't hide that light under a bushel. You know, many people are saved and they never talk about the Lord Jesus Christ with anyone, right? The shepherds could have done that. They could have kept that blessing to themselves. Heard it, went, saw the Lord Jesus. Ah, great. Go back to just shepherding. Never told anyone else. But they didn't do that. They're a good example of what people and Christians should do. When they get saved, they hear about the Lord Jesus. They don't keep it to themselves. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. This is what I mean by when I think about Mary and Joseph and I think about all these things that are happening to them. You know, the angel visiting, angel visiting. You know, you've got John the Baptist being born. He's going to be the messenger of the Lord, right? And now they have to go. They, they, they think, you know, you wonder. They're going down to Bethlehem. Do they know they're fulfilling prophecy? They're getting taxed. And then they can't stay in the inn. They're in the stable. And all of a sudden... We heard, uh, you know, there's a baby <laughs> being born. What are Mary and Joseph thinking? They're thinking, how do these people, like, you know, all these things are like coming to a head, you know? Like, it's just all these confirmations that, you know, that this baby is, but, you know, you think the virgin birth is enough, but all these things are happening. And obviously they don't hear about it, but there's all these witnesses testifying of the Lord coming. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen, and it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So I won't spend too much time on this, but you can see after eight days, it's the covenant of circumcision. Genesis 17 is where we see that covenant where after eight days, the males are meant to be circumcised in Israel. 
Luke 2.22, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So what I'm trying to show you here is that there's quite a significant amount of time that passes between when Jesus is born, he's in the stable, now they're going to Jerusalem to present him according to the law for the firstborn. So what is this law? As it is written in the law of the Lord, every mouth that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So you can see, like with John the Baptist, eight days later, males are circumcised, and it seems that the tradition there is that's when they are named. That's when they're given their names. But you can see here in Luke 22, it says, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished. What is this referring to? We'll read Leviticus 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So we see there the first seven days she's unclean. Eighth day, so why is that? Because now you know, it looks like you know, John the Baptist, people come together circumcising a child, naming the child, it's like a big event, right? But they can't prior because she's considered unclean. They don't want to be unclean because they may need to go to the temple and things like that. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying, so this is what it's referring to, three and thirty days she shall touch no hallowed thing nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. But if she bear a maid child, so the child's a, a woman, then she shall be unclean two weeks as in her separation and she shall continue in the blood of her purifying three score and six days. So now why that is different, I don't know. But the Bible says seven days for a child, eighth day circumcised. For a woman, it's two weeks, right? And then the purifying of her blood is 33 days for a male. For a woman, it's 66 days. So, right? so this is what it's referring to. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, so this is after the days of the purifying, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, unto the priest, who shall offer it before the Lord and make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. So this is the offering they have to go do. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, so this is what's in, uh, interesting to the story. If she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles so that's, that's a bird, all right? that's not two, two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. So you see, what did Mary offer? Mary offered two, two birds, didn't she? So it showed how poor they were, that they could not afford to sacrifice that lamb. They offered the two turtle doves to show that Jesus Christ was born of a poor family. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. So where are they after this purifying, right? Now they're in Jerusalem. So if you remember that map I showed you, Jerusalem and Bethlehem were quite close together. So they had to travel to Jerusalem to present Jesus Christ and do the sacrifice. While they're at Jerusalem, just like they weren't expecting a visit from the shepherds, I'm sure they weren't expecting the people at the temple to know who Jesus Christ was either. A man whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, how old was this guy? I don't know. But it would have been interesting if he was like 150 200 years old, just like supernaturally older than every other person. Why? Why was he? Because he was not going to pass away until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. So he's waiting one day to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Mary and Joseph come to present and to do their sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ, he already knows the Lord Jesus Christ is here. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up into his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, 
and now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. So every time I read that, I wonder whether he's maybe just feeling like he's living a bit too long. But, you know, it seems like he's looking forward to moving on, maybe because he's quite old. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. So this is the verse that kind of got me thinking about what Joseph and Mary are thinking throughout all this because, you know, you know they're from humble beginnings and they're going around and you know, it's like all these things are happening to them, confirming uh, the blessing that they have um, in their arms. And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many. So I'll skip through this for sake of time. But you see here, you know, he mentions some things about Jesus Christ. Not only him, there's another witness at the temple as well. Anna, who is a prophetess. prophetess. She's an older lady. She also um, confirms the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, um, unto them. And these, are, these people are known as the two witnesses in the temple. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, if you leave it there, you will think that, see here, they're living in Bethlehem. So you remember, that's where Jesus Christ was born. Seven days later, eight, unclean, eight days, circumcision. Then 33 days, purifying. They now travel to Jerusalem, right? And then after they do their thing, they, you think, according to that verse, that they just travel straight back here which is not the case, right? So there are events that happen between them fulfilling this law and returning to Nazareth, and that's what we read in Matthew 2, where we read about the wise men. So you can see here that the wise men, the reason why I'm telling you about this time frame is that quite a bit of time passes before they are visited by the wise men. Right? So it's not that the shepherds and the wise men all come together and they converge at the stable and they all see Jesus Christ. No, the only ones that see Jesus Christ in the stable are the shepherds. And maybe when the shepherds told everyone in the town, other people maybe are coming to see the Lord Jesus Christ as well because they heard what the shepherds said. But the wise men, no, the wise men come much later. And this is why... I'm saying a lot of these traditions and misconceptions and songs that are sung at Christmas time are teaching people the, in, an incorrect Christmas story. But you're learning the true Christmas story today. Matthew 2 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. So, wise men are not kings, right? So, it's not three kings coming over. We have not given the number. We're just told wise men from the east to Jerusalem. But wise men are not kings. Genesis 41. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So that is in the days of Joseph. So Joseph was one of the wise men of Egypt. So these are just people that, you know, were wise. But not necessarily kings. Daniel was a wise man. Daniel 5, 7, the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon. So see how these people that were experts in their fields, right? And obviously the wise men that knew the Lord God, they were the wise men of the God of Israel. Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So these wise men come from the east, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and I come to worship him. So they're coming from this direction, right? They're coming from the east, and they are traveling to Jerusalem, to the capital city, because they see a star from the east, and that's what they're following. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. You know, it's your typical person in power. They're just worried about self-preservation. 
And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. So obviously he is trying to find out where Jesus Christ is going to be born because he's trying to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, is he doing it of his own accord? Is it Satan doing it? But this is Satan's agenda. He wants to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> like we see in Revelation, the dragon. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, For thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. See, so when King Herod demands of the wise men, where should Jesus be born? They know instantly. And this is why I wonder, how did Joseph and Mary not know? Or did they know? I don't know how that all ties together, but it's an interesting thing to think about. Micah 5, 2. So this is the prophecy here. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. So what's Herod trying to do? He's trying to work out roughly how old Jesus Christ should be. You know, it's like, oh, okay, star appeared six months ago, you, know, you travel here, you know, like he's trying to figure out how old this baby will be. So we don't know, but we know it's up to two years old because that's how, who he tries to kill. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. So he doesn't know how long they're going to take to find Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. Thankfully for the wise men, when they left, a star appears to them to guide them. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, some people, they try and always create naturalistic explanations for everything they see in the Bible. And they say, well, maybe the star that they followed was this star that happened to be brighter at this time of the year and that they were following it. But I don't believe that. I believe this is just a supernatural star that appeared. Why do I believe that? Because if it's just some star in the atmosphere, how do they know which house to go into? Right? So this is why I think it's a supernatural star because the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came, look, and stood over where the young child was. Now it was just in the sky. I mean, how do you know in Bethlehem which house you know, Jesus is in? So this is why I think it's something supernatural that is guiding them. Um, makes you wonder as well, were they the only ones that could see the star? Because if you're in Bethlehem and there's this huge star over somebody's house, I mean, wouldn't you wonder? Like, man, this is... I don't know. But it must be something that they can just see because, like I said, that, that would cause quite a stir in the town of Bethlehem if there's this big star over one house. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child... So you see, this is why it's important. I'm just trying to break some misconceptions here this morning. If you never hear me preach on the true Christmas story, the wise men are not at the stable. You see, they have come later. Jesus is already a young child now. And where did they come into? They came into the house. Remember, they tried to go to the inn. There was no room. Then they went to the stable. Now, time has passed. They didn't stay in the stable. You know? Now they're living in a house in Bethlehem. Right? So they have not yet returned to Nazareth. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with mother, Mary his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So this is why the wise men are normally represented by three people, because of the three different gifts that were offered to the Lord Jesus. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. There's a lot of communication from God via dreams, and not just for the wise men, but Joseph as well. Always makes me wonder how they distinguish between just a regular dream and a dream you know, from God, I mean, whether to act on it or not. Um, I guess I'll let you know if I get my first uh, dream from God. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. 
So this is the second time now we're told that Joseph has a dream to warn him, give, give him a message that he then acts on. So that's why I sometimes think, you know, how did Joseph know that this was like, not just something he was like imagining in his dream, but it was from the Lord. It must have been different than just his regular dreams in his night. So you know, he gets this dream. So which way is Egypt? Egypt's that way, right? So they flee from Bethlehem into Egypt, right? And was there until the death of Herod that it might be filled, fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. So where is this prophecy? This prophecy is in Hosea 11. When Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. And it's interesting because, you know, this kind of has like a double, right? Because Israel was taken out of Egypt, out of captivity. But it was also a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ that, you know, they flew into Egypt and he fled. So this is what I'm saying, like, you know, when I talk about salvation and I say, look, you can't just base everything you believe on the Old Testament alone without considering the New Testament because would people really know that this is a prophecy about Jesus Christ if the New Testament didn't tell us this is a prophecy of Jesus Christ and not just, you know, uh, referring to Israel? Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, what is this referring to? Because he sent them into Bethlehem, he doesn't realize that they've been led by a star. He's maybe waiting for them to return. How long does he wait? We don't really know. But he's calculated from when the star appeared that probably Jesus, maximum, about two years old. So a lot of time has passed. He realizes these wise men are not coming back, right? They did a no-show on him. Was exceeding wrath and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled. So there's some, some atrocious things happening around the story of the birth of Jesus Christ. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. Yeah, it just makes me think, you know, and maybe COVID makes you reflect on it, that people, you know, I mean, Herod didn't go around killing all these babies himself makes you think that there were people back then willing to just blindly follow the instructions of Herod and just go around murdering children. You know, they had to do that. So it's quite, it's quite an amazing thing what people are willing to do if they, uh, you know, just blindly follow authority, don't they? Some atrocious things have been committed, um, you know, like I said, when soldiers uh, blindly follow orders. <laughs> but when Herod was dead... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. <laughs> it's like the third time. Makes me wonder whether Joseph worries about God asleep because he's always getting dreams, telling him, like warning him of things, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. So I think that he actually intended, because remember they moved from Nazareth, because I'm sure in those days it's not like you just take a plane down, fly down, come back, maybe they actually moved all their belongings and, and moved to Bethlehem, right? Because it was too hard to move. Remember, they didn't have a lot of money. So I think they moved into a house. He was going to come back to Bethlehem. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither, notwithstanding being warned of God in a dream. This is a fourth one now. He turned aside into the parts of Galilee and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. So he doesn't go back now. They, now that, that's what actually brings them back to Nazareth. Now, I was trying to find like where this prophecy is, he shall be called a Nazarene. And I thought, well, maybe it doesn't say it is written. It says that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Maybe this is just something the prophets taught, and it's not something that is actually written in Scripture. Um, there is one theory, though, that when it says he shall be called a Nazarene, like I said, the people in Nazareth were thought of as quite poor and lowly. So some people believe that what this is referring to is not that there's a, a scripture saying he's called a Nazarene, like of the place, but as actually a Nazarene of the socioeconomic of people. You know, because some people um, say that the word Nazarene means despised and rejected. And this is why the people of Nazareth were quite a lowly people. 
And there's evidence of this in John 1, 45. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So I just wonder whether this has a double meaning, where, yes, he's called a Nazarene in the sense that people believed he was from Nazareth because that's where he grew up. But remember, he was born in Bethlehem, which was why some people doubted whether or not he was the Messiah because they knew the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem of Nazareth. But also, he is referred to as Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of Bethlehem, because maybe it's also a reminder as well that Jesus would suffer and die. He was despised and rejected of men. And look here, Nathanael said unto him, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? So you can see the way people thought about the city Nazareth. And this is where Jesus' parents came from, uh, where, they, where they lived. Philip saith unto him, come and see. So that is the true story of Christmas and the timeline of events. So now, when you see the nativity scene you can see where it's inaccurate you know and um you know sometimes when you see christmas cartoons it is accurate uh, i was given these flashcards by somebody many years ago and my wife put them you know on the wall uh you know for for christmas now one thing i don't like is, is, is you you'll never find pictures of angels without wings I'm of the firm belief that angels do not have wings, right? That angels look like men. And what, why we think angels have wings is because cherubims have two wings and Satan is a cherubim. Some people believe Satan is a fallen angel, but he's not. He's a different creature, right? He's a cherubim. And you have the seraphim, which have six wings, right? So I think that has just sort of all molded together that people give angels wings and... and you know, sometimes there are female and male angels, and I don't believe that's the case. I think angels are always male. And now you know that the wise men did not come and visit Jesus at the stable. They visited him in the house. So here's another one that is wrong. You can see there, so this is not correct, where they all came together at the stable. Uh, the wise men came later, right? Um, you know, there's another one. Even when you buy crafts, you'll see that you know, the wise men and the shepherds all coming together. Here too, you know, so it's, it's almost like, you know, the star is over the stable and they're coming to the stable, which is not the case, right? They went into a house. Uh, this one, you, you don't even have the shepherds here. This one is like just the wise men in the stable. You know, maybe the shepherds are already gone in this case, but again, the wise men did not come to the stable. Here you have the shepherds, but what's wrong with this picture? Who knows? Of the per people that don't, the people that, yeah, yeah, Jesus is too young. Oh, no, he's too, not too young. No, that's when he was born. This is the shepherds coming. He's not, remember, what was the sign? You shall see the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So I don't think this is good to depict it this way. Because that was one of the signs told to the shepherds of that you'd know it was the Messiah. Obviously, he's in the manger, but he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. But I think a lot of the Catholic depictions of the uh, nativity scene, like he's just in diapers. You know, he's not wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. So, uh, again, here, I was just showing this one because I just thought, like, it's like a really small stable. You know? It's like a little cave. Or maybe it goes deeper than we realize. Yeah. Okay, that one. So this one is accurate. This is the shepherds. Calm, he's wrapped, but you can't see baby Jesus there. But I just wonder why they drew him like so tiny. Like his head is like tiny. Maybe he's just like freshly, nearly born. I don't think he was born premature. So he's really small. Uh, this one I think is pretty accurate. It's only shepherds. Calm, he's wrapped. Swaddling clothes. All right, so Merry Christmas. Yeah, fun celebrating with your family. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can uh, learn the true story of Christmas. And we pray, Lord, that you know, this is uh, what we teach and what people know. So um, you know, when, when our children learn about Christmas, you know, they're not only just learning a tradition that they realize is full of inaccuracies later, 
but they're learning your word. They're learning the true story of Christmas. So thank you again, Lord, for coming and dying for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.